I felt like we should have been dancing at that point. <laughs> I, I was a little bit, and then I'd stop right before it happened. Um, but word. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, 2023 Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. Bienvenidos a Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. My name is Julian Randall, and I am joined uh, in this panel. I'm honored to be joined in this panel by the amazing... Lillian Rivera. Hey, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> yes. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon to all, everybody in our chat. I would invite you to read our anti-harassment policy in the chat box. And don't forget to subscribe to the Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival's uh, YouTube channel. And if you are a school, classroom, librarian, or educator joining us, our school visit fund is back. So you can enter to win a free virtual visit from a Latinx author or illustrator for, for your classroom or library. You can find the link to the entry form in the chat. All right. So uh, do we, uh, I guess we introduce ourselves. Why don't you start? I'm so sorry. Uh, no, 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 was... we are, we're good. You, you introduce yourself and tell us about your book and then I'll go. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Hi everybody. Like I said, my name is Julian Randall. I am a, uh, Black Dominican author from Chicago, very much like my Black Dominican protagonist, Pilar Ramirez, of this, the second book in the Pilar Ramirez duet, Pilar Ramirez and the Curse of San Zenon. So the book basically follows a Black Latinx girl from the exact same block in Chicago that I am from. She's trying to put together a documentary about her cousin, Natasha, who disappeared 50 years ago during the Trujillo, which dominated the Dominican Republic for over 31 years. Along her journeys, she ended up falling through a blank sheet of paper and ended up saving the world. And now she's back to try and do it again. Now, one year removed from her uh, adventures in the land of Zafa, she's on her first trip to the island. She's on this diasporic trip. And normally this would be enough for any kid to handle. But unfortunately for Pilar, I am her author. So now all kinds of other terrible things are happening, including a storm that only she appears to be able to see, the rise of an ancient evil, and the return of a rival from her previous books. So Pilar is in a race against the clock to try and save the world, her family, and herself. Oh, I think Lillian, what's your book about? Well, I, um, I'm Lillian Rivera. The book is called Barely Floating. It's a middle grade book um, about uh, a 12 year old Natalia uh, de la Cruz, who is fat and proud, who lives in um, East Los Angeles. And um, she comes from a um, pretty active activist family, kind of very rooted in the community. Um, so she's, you know, she's been, she was raised to be down with the cause. And of course, um, she also loves fashion and glamour, but that's sort of against uh, what her uh, up, upbringing has, you know, they brought, you know, they raised her not to really kind of, they, they've taught her the truths of all that, right? And so, but she falls in love with uh, synchronized swimming, aka artistic swimming, and she will do whatever she can to uh, be a synchronized swimmer. And um, that, you know, entails a lot of uh, 
machinations, a lot of uh, fibs, <laughs> a lot of stuff. So it's it's a really sweet uh, and funny, very funny book about uh, family and and how you can uh, own what you love, you know, regardless of uh, other things. So um, I think we were supposed to share a little bit of something that happened to us when we were little, a childhood writing experience, a childhood memory. Julia, do you want to share yours first? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so this is actually going to sound very familiar now that you know what happened to Pilar. But when I was a kid, about eight years old, they asked us to write a story in class. And I wrote a story about a little boy named Julian who what, found a portal to a magical world inside of his locker that was dominated by mutant spiders. And I get into the end of this story and I was like, this is really good. This is fine American literature right here. So I had it all printed out and I drew my own cover and I stuffed it under my shirt the next time that we were going to the bookstore. And I like shuffled up to the uh, kids section in Barnes and Noble and I was like, P, Q, R, R, A. And I put the like little printed out pages on there because I was like, that's where you should, like if you want your book to get picked up, you should take it to where other books are. And by the time that I came back, it was gone. So I was like, <laughs> Hey, I have one fan. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing that you were even thinking that far ahead of like, I'm going to, I'm just going to, you know, I belong in, on the shelf and I'm going to put myself in there. That's, that's super powerful. That is a superhero power right there. If I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, yo. What's your, what's your origin story as it were? <laughs> well, I have a really strange story that happened to me when I, I grew up in the projects, you know, from, I'm from the Bronx, even though I live in Los Angeles now, but I, I there was one time I was going to go to the store, you know, to the bodega and I ended up getting uh, stuck in the elevator by myself with no, you know, just stuck there for hours. And I just, all I had, because this is the way I was raised or this is the way I coped with anything was I, I had a paper and pen with me because I always walked around with paper and pen. And I wrote, I wrote a story about a girl who's stuck in an elevator and how she raised herself <laughs> in this elevator. And I believe that was really like the, the, you know, I did that until finally the fireman came and picked me up and you know raised me from the, <laughs> from the depths of an elevator shaft and um but you know it was that idea of like at that very young age i really was using story to try to cope with whatever was happening fun or funny or or traumatic whatever it was writing to me was really my my superpower i adore that story and would pre-order that book today <laughs> like I, I i was like i must know more about everything that's going on in this elevator shaft <laughs> so just like, Too it much, just feels though. really rich it just, uh, <laughs> plus just lifelong fan of your work so. <laughs> <laughs> thanks julian so julian we're gonna start our we're gonna well everyone who's on here and hello to everyone who is on online we're gonna start our our mentor text because this is a presentation for ed educators and can use hopefully and um julianne why don't you start us off uh with um yeah with pilar yeah absolutely and uh everybody just have something out to write with or write on so this is a section of pilar too uh, during which, like I said, she's on her first trip to the island. She's in uh, Plaza Colonial, uh, which is like one of the first sites in all of Santo Domingo, right? And she has just found, well, <clears throat> she is standing outside of Trujillo's palace, which she has only just realized. I could see Dr. Vega's lips moving. She was saying more, pero I wasn't hearing a word. That cold, wrong feeling swirled throughout my whole body underneath my skin until the only warmth on me was the flask of La Negra that hung on a necklace tucked into my shirt. We were standing next to Trujillo's palace, above the space where slave auctions had happened. How could people grin and eat tourist food where I could have been sold once? Could this have been where Trujillo was sitting when he gave the order to try and snuff out Mami and Natasha and Abuela? Was this where he sat when he decided we didn't matter enough to leave alive? I had a mission, but the sky had gone inky with clouds like it was about to open up. I felt myself fall down, the grief of the storm loud, dark, and everywhere. Mm, I love that. You know, I and I apologize. I think I, I went a little bit out of order in our, in our thing, and that's just me not uh, paying attention. 
my apologies. <laughs> but anyway, I love this this excerpt anyway. <laughs> um, no way. I, I realized that I'm like, wait, we have to talk about the essential question. And you mentioned, we both talked about our books, apologies. And now the essential question, pen in handy. What is our essential question? No worries. Actually, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the essential question, ah, sorry. So my essential question is that I end up asking my characters that then uh, tap into the uh, kind of concepts and principles that we wanted to clarify out rip, right? The first question that I like to ask a character is what do you see magic in? And that can be a character who's contemporary, it can be a character who is fantasy oriented, which is a term that we're gonna define in a second. But essentially right now, for instance, I'm working on a book about a, ba a basketball player who says that he, who is realizing he has anxiety for the first time. And his, to him, magic is to see what the ball is able to do in the hands of a true master, which is really a story about how much he admires the way his dad is able to handle the ball, right? For Pilar, it's mu the magic is much more tangible, but the first thing that she ever sees magic in is her family. Like ultimately the first magical person in her life was her mom. And that's another way that she is very much like me, right? She sees magic in her mom. She sees magic in this connection that she has with this island that she is from and yet has never been to. She sees magic in the history of that. She sees magic in the history of that place. And so that brings me to another question about magic, right? Of like, Every question about magic is at some level a question about power. That's why we're here, just to ask our questions about what superpowers there are. And so I like to think that the easiest way to know about a superpower is to ask first about where the, where the power has been lacking. So has your power or lack of power ever been used against you? For Pilar, the central trauma uh, that like kind of informs where her power comes from is that Natasha was kidnapped long before she was born. And that's the trauma that has affected her mom and has made her interested in all of this history because she wants to figure out what happened in this mysterious circumstance that happened to people all the time in DR back in the day. Where Trujillo didn't like you, you just disappear, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then we have to ask the question that this passage is starting to ask us about Pilar, which is what's the scariest part about losing control? What's the scariest part about not being able to see or do the things that you're normally used to being able to see or do or being able to have access to your power. And for Pilar, it's always about how do I protect the people around me? How do I protect those I love? Her making this connection of not only the tremendous anti-Blackness of there being slave auctions in this place, but the correlation of like, oh, of course, this is this site of evil is where Trujillo would, part, would set up shop. <clears throat> How do we make how do we make sense of that? How do we square that? And it's overwhelming, and it ends up causing her to pass out. So there's a way that this power becomes this huge burden on her as well, right? Mm -hmm. So then, if we're thinking about burden and we're thinking about power in the same place, my final question is: What is the quietest way your power protects you, and who do you wish mm -hmm. your power could protect? And so with Bilal, we find that out across the course of the books that. She is protected by her power insofar as it's alive and it's with her and she's in conversation with it. And she wishes her power could protect all of the women in her family, which is ultimately what makes her my hero. Oh, I love Pilar. She's wonderful. <laughs> so the essential questions that we're asking is we're talking about two very different types of books. Like P Pilar, uh, Julianne's books is very rooted into like the fantastical kind of world. I mean, she's falling through uh, paper <laughs> and entering a whole, a whole new wild adventure. And then with, um, with Barely Floating, we just have like sort of a very contemporary story. She doesn't, she doesn't have like, you know, inner powers or wakes up and is able to, you know, have gills and swim underwater in any kind of way. I don't think she does. And um, but I what I love is that it doesn't matter if a if a writer is writing something that is fantastical or contemporary. You could always be asking these kind of questions about what you know, what question can you ask your character to discover their superpowers? What are their where do their superpowers lie? And then we go into these ideas of like how does burden play into if a superpower how does you know what heroic actions all these kind of things so we have some definitions that we kind of picked out that um juliana had already mentioned throughout you know when he was talking these kind of things that we could really kind of dig into when we're when we're creating our characters when we're just like trying to figure out what what are the burdens and what is it that they're 
they're tasked with when it comes to their superpower, even if their superpower isn't fantastical or, you know, in a magical world or a fantastic fantasy world, even if they're just, you know, Natalia, who, you know, I think has a superpower of being really rooted in, in her, in her body, really in your face is aware of, you know, what is wrong. I will tell you. <laughs> and, um, and isn't afraid to like just school people about those things, <laughs> which I, you know, I really wish I was when I was that young. <laughs> I was way more quiet. <laughs> um, can we put up uh, some of the definitions that we have that we, that would be lovely. Uh, okay, so Juliet, I think you picked these, this word, objective and yes. motivation. Yeah, can you? <clears throat> Cool, so wonderful. Yeah, so to use Pilar again as an example here, right? What the character desires versus why they desire it. Pilar goes off on the initial journey that like leads her to Zafa, leads her to this land of Dominican mythos and magic, which has been dominated by the Dominican boogeyman El Cuco for hundreds of years. <clears throat> Because her initial, de her desire is that she wants to find out what happened to Natasha. Why she desires it is connected, but separate, right? What she actually wants is to make sure that she can make her mom feel better. Like mm -hmm. internally, what she's actually trying to do is bring her family back together. She's trying to undo that kind of grief. So understanding that like your characters were going to initially come to you, or at least my characters initially come to me, always very goal oriented, like very earth sign little kids. <laughs> I'm just like, they just wanna, just wanna, they're like, I wanna go here, I wanna go right to the top. And I'm like, all right, re let's reel in that Capricorn and get to some pentacles. Why do you wanna do this thing? Because otherwise you end up with characters who are tools, not people. I love that. I'm very Capricorn. Do you do your signs for all your characters? Because I know I do. Oh, I love doing their charts. I, like ever since I figured out how to do that, I was like, oh, okay. The characters, like they, they sound so much different from each other now. I love this. And I'll do the same thing with um, with um, Nat. Natalia also loves to, she, her desire is to be seen, you know, to be a synchronized swimmer and to be re at the center of the action of being praised, right? Um, versus why they desire it. They desire it because they're afraid to even, they know they have to hide this desire from a mom who believes that swimming is really just meant for thin, rich, white girls. You know, it's a very specific, you know, uh, sport, you know, um, and her mom wants to protect her, but her mom doesn't, you know, so that really kind of like the desire is like, she wants to prove to her mom that she's more than just, you know, down with the call. She's more than that. She has her own opinions, you know, in this family and she should be respected in that sense. So um, even as a 12 year old. So I really love that objective versus motivation. And what's the next one? The next uh, word is fantasy, which we had mentioned fantasy versus contemporary and stories that feature magical elements like Julianne's book would be that and versus contemporary, which is barely floating like myself and stories set in the present without magical elements, which is mine, is basically set in the present. And and Julianne's book is sort of uh, enters into a whole different world. It's a, a different world, or is it in within, like contemporary magical? Is it? So it ended up becoming, <clears throat> so I was, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to do this together or we wanted to do it like a separate, because so I was like, Pilar starts in Chicago in very contemporary setting, has never like experienced any uh, like, ephemeral ma and ephemeral ma magic, right? All the magic she's ever experienced comes from like just watching the magic of her mom going about her day to day. And then she falls through that piece of paper and suddenly she is in a fantastical world where everything, <laughs> where everything is magic and nothing has batteries. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love, but they both, this is a thing that's very similar to both of them is they're both entering a new world. Like they entering yeah. a world that has rules that we don't know about. And, you know, Nat is really entering, you know, synchronized swimming, there are terms, there are, you know, rules by which she has to follow. And so they're both kind of like exploring a new space. Um, even if it's, you know, fantastical, contemporary, fanta beginning con contemporary, ending in fantastical, whatever it is, but they're both similar in that sense. For sure, yeah, for sure. Okay, and then the next one, uh, heroic actions, of course. And these are these are two characters who I feel would be either really like each other or <laughs> or be you know we're on the same team or you're too much. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> For um, sure. Go talk to about burden because you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. So the thing uh, in terms of like Pilar's power, right, is that like, you know, she is a bruja. She has a connection to this black sand that used to cover all of Zafa, Cala Negra, and it contains all of Dominican mythos and memory. And to be in conversation with that, it has lent her like enormous power in terms of the ability to just like do magic and like fight back and like protect herself. But also by virtue of the fact that she has this ability to see elements of the past, see things that La Negra remembers. She has this connection to this diasporic weight, right? And the reason I named it La Negra was to make sure that Pilar was undeniably a Black Dominicana, that like that was not something about her that could be erased. And so for her to stand in La Plaza Colonial, like that line where she's talking about like, how can people like sit here and like eat crumpets and tortillas where like I could have been sold once is a weight that she is carrying that the other people around her do not necessarily have because of that connection, because of that power, right? And because of it, you know, other people might experience, like I experienced during the real version of this story, which is almost verbatim. <laughs> um, during the real version of this story, I started having, I started to have a panic attack because I was like, I was feeling this weight of like this connection to this enormous power of being like a black Latinx person, but also this tremendous weight of like, well, how did we get here? <laughs> What is the what is the forever story of how we got here? Mm. And so that's the, a way that Pilar's power becomes a burden for her is that she's trying to manage that like, hey, like this power is giving me anxiety because unfortunately for her, I'm her author. So like all my characters, she has anxiety. <laughs> and I think it's super important too because of our, our middle age group, how how um, how these these uh, aspects of burden of, of be, you know of holding weight as a young kid that that it's so prevalent to this age group as well. Like I, I think it's really important for our for these books to just to even acknowledge that, but also just how do we how do these young kids you know offer like solutions in a way, not being and not being so didactic of like oh this is how you do it, you know. But it's more like you know with Nat, her burden is really that she's is very rageful <laughs> at times and and this you know her anger is you know people want to contain that and and you know young girls they're not supposed to be rageful they're you know you're supposed to be quiet and um and that's not very becoming of a person of a young person and and i love that sometimes she is rageful and sometimes her 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 you know it's okay like let's figure out other ways for her to 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 co you know to handle that kind of like rage and you know and what she can do that's maybe mindfulness and other aspects of that burden of burden of like how do i cope with these emotions that are very intense you know mm -hmm. um and so yeah so anyway i i just love this word and how important it is for this age group specifically um sure. okay let's move on to the next one thank you <laughs> Okay, so this was is oh your this is the mentor text, right? Yeah, I think okay. I think we are uh, yeah <laughs> we went through this, <laughs> so no, I think sorry, now is actually our time for a little bit of student practice. Yes, <laughs> which is exciting because then after that we get to like hear from Nat, and that's the part that I'm most excited about <laughs> me personally. Okay, um, but yes, okay. So for student practice, pull out uh, your pens, your paper whatever it is that you write with or write on, um, and make a list of five superpowers that your character may have. So yeah, five superpowers your character may have, and we're gonna give it three minutes, and then we're gonna come back. Sound good? I'll just, I'll just I realize that nobody else can hear me, but <laughs> I, mean, I hope that y'all, it's good, it sounds good to y'all. <laughs> okay, the timer has started. We're gonna do three minutes and I'm gonna stop talking because this is my problem when I have a timer. <laughs> <laughs>
We've got about 30 seconds left. And we back, and we back, and we back, and we back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This is, I love kind of superhero stuff because I want, I think that's an easy prompt for any, anyone, myself, kids who could do it easily. Um, so I love this list and I love lists, right? And you're, you're a poet, so you, you love lists as well. Oh, always, always. I love a, <laughs> I love a predetermined structure. <laughs> exactly. Like, let me just like, yes, tell me about this poetic form. I'm going to pour my feelings right inside and leave. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so we're going to go to our next one, which is um, I'll read an example of um, from Barely Floating. And this is the mentor text. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll just read this. Um, the other day, Joanne asked me how it feels to be in the water. It's hard to explain. In the pool, I feel both weightless and strong. When I do a tuck, I bring both my knees up to my chest while sculling. Sculling means I'm moving my hands quickly in the water to keep my body from traveling across the pool. I then push my head back going into a flip underwater, scooping the water to help propel my body backwards. I have to do this movement really slow without traveling. It's not easy. You have to concentrate on so many things, making sure you're using your stomach muscles, that you're not splashing water. It's intense. Under the water, I'm able to accomplish so much. There's nothing clumsy or weird about me. I feel invincible. Now, this is, um, you know, I had, uh, my daughter was a synchronized swimmer for about seven years. So this world, I am very well versed in. Um, I spent a lot of years just taking her to competitions throughout LA and so I, I really, you know, when I was looking up these terms, you know, I, I hired her as a consultant because <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I get these terms correctly because I am not a swimmer, unlike my daughters. Um, so, but I love this because Nat is, she is fearless and the, the pool is her arena. She owns that pool. And so when she becomes a part of a synchronized swimming team, she those kind of superpowers, her powers are even elevated more. They kind of like come out even more so because she's just like, oh, I can do this. I could do a flip and I could do the sculling and I could do all these kind of th technical terms that are seem outrageous to me because I'm like, I don't know how anyone does those things. But for her, they really just kind of enhance her, her superpowers, you know. And so she doesn't feel exactly that doesn't feel clumsy. She feels invincible. The sports helps her discover her new power, superpower. And, but the not, but Nat feels this burden, right? That with this new power, superpower, she's unable to share it with her family because she fears that they're going to um, not approve, right? And she knows this. She specifically asked her her mom, "Will can you sign me up?" And they were like, "No." And so she's just like, "How do I? How do I um, keep this 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 thing that I know I'm good at? This gift." How do I keep it and show it to them? She's like, I'll show it to them. I'll prove it to them later. If I just keep doing it, eventually they'll they'll grow to understand that I, you know, I belong here. But you know, she keeps it superpower a secret, and that's not good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so that is her superpower is restraint, but her burden is this this idea of like she can't share what her what her love is with her family, you know. So um you know, what do we do? So we're going to do a little mini practice and this will kind of build up with what our first list of uh, superpower lists, which we just did. And we'll do another uh, mini, what from that list that you created, you should choose one superpower and break down how that superpower can become a burden. So again, we did that list of all the superpowers and now we just pick one, one of those superpowers and how do what, how does that superpower become a burden? And I had mentioned with Nat and her super. What about Pilar's super super hard and her burden? I think you had mentioned it, but uh, tell it to us again. 
Definitely. So Pilar is also uh, in this book in a mode where she is definitely hiding the emergence of her superpower. The fact that she found Natasha, she's carrying a lot of just like secrets and weight on top of her shoulders as she's moving through a bunch of other familial secrets and weight. And so she's feeling definitely just that burden of like, how do you deal with being the person who remembers everything? So yeah, definitely the, a way that her, her superpower can become a burden. Another one that I always really loved is that there was a super, there was a hero that had super speed, not the Flash, but I think also the Flash. But they were like every like regular moment is excruciatingly long now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, dang, I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, I mean, I imagine that chopping vegetables, if you're the Flash and you have to do it at like normal human speed, is just like this is the worst thing that has ever happened. <laughs> the burden, the burden of. The burden. <laughs> okay, so then let's give them uh, three minutes for you to select a, one of your superpowers that you listed before, and then just really think about what that power, how does that superpower become a burden? What, what, are, the th what are the kind of weight uh, that you would have to carry with you, as your character would have to carry with them um, in order to just, you know, handle both, right? Handle this superpower and handle this pa this burden as well. And so we'll do uh, three minutes. Okay. We've got about one minute left. And we bet, and we bet, and we bet, and we bet, and we bet. <laughs> I hope everyone were, was able to do these uh, these exercises. I love, like I said, I love kind of ask uh, the whole thing when it comes to my writing. And I don't know if you do this as well. Is that I'm on just always asking my characters questions. 
Oh, and some of those questions are uncomfortable questions, right? So it's just like, oh, you have a super, you know, your superpower is this, you, you're, you're fearless underwater, but your superpower is also that you're afraid that your mom is never, is not going to love you as much as you, maybe you love sacred ice swimming, you know, that maybe she'll not love you as much, you know, or she'll be disappointed. And that's really scary for a young kid to, to even try to articulate that kind of fear. Um, but yeah, right. You're, you're do the same thing with your characters. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. No, it's, I, it's why I own so many different sets of headphones because I will just walk along the track outside my house and it's, it's more helpful if they don't see me just talking to the air. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it makes me feel better about how I'm affecting the people around me, but I'll be walking. I'll, I'll, just like, I'll walk with Pilar all the time and just be like, yo, like, so like, what, what, why are we not getting through this chapter? <laughs> what is going on what's what how are you feeling what's in your what's on your heart and like you know over time she's become like a little sister to me um oh, yeah. and that's been really special um and definitely set the tone for how i like interview all of my characters now this is my first time right now the process i'm moving through this is my first time making a story bible and i'm just like mm. interviewing all the characters like i'm doing them for a magazine profile <laughs> Oh my, I've, yeah, I've taught that where it's like, I've heard of story babbles being almost way longer, like 300 pages, com you know, compared to the novel itself. Like people really go into the world, right? And, you know, it doesn't have to be that intense. My, you know, I've created character sketches, which are only like a page, you know, and doesn't really have to like, you know, fall, dig deep. But I love that idea of like, especially if you're writing fantasy is to have that kind of like, oh, what are the rules? Okay, I have them in my story Bible, you know? I like they're just, there. they're there, they're set up. I understand, I understand my characters. I understand why they're there this particular day, which like, I don't remember who it was who like most recently asked me that question, but it was the first time that it ever really registered. I'm like, why is it today? <laughs> like, <laughs> what what is the most important day of your life? And no, it's, it's that's a big question to ask your character. Like, why today? It, well, how is today unlike any other day? You know, yeah, what, hap what happens to you today? And um, and I could say, you know, in my first chapter, Natalie sees synchronized swimming being performed for the first time. And she's like, wait a minute. You know, what is that? And how do I get into it? <laughs> you know, yeah, and that's that's, that. that's that's a different day for her, you know? <laughs> yeah, real facts, real facts. So, um, okay, so then let's see. I know that we we have our recaps. We're almost ending. We and maybe we have some time for questions. I think, but uh, let's talk about you know the the uh, vocabulary words that we presented. Um, let's see, her heroic actions, objective versus motivation, which I think is really important, and I love that you brought that one up. Um, and then we have burdens of fantasy and contemporary. Um, and again just really thinking about like your character does not have to, you know, you could have a superhero and, and I know young people love writing those characters, but you could think about these kind of characters as well. If it's just contemporary, like this idea of like your, the super, that, that superhero power that they have doesn't have to be fantastical. It could just be, you know, outside of like the fantastic, the fantasy of the world, Bilar's power is even greater, you know, when you strip it of like the fantastical, you know, her emotions or how she feels about family and all this, like the, the, that digs deeper into like that. So I kind of love, you know, just even playing around with it, even in a fantastical setting as well. Yeah. Yeah. And do you want to add anything else? Oh, look at this. Prompts. <laughs> Where? I guess I will add the prompts. <laughs> um, okay. So for option one, you can write a moment where your character wished they were more powerful. Um, and to just kind of like toss in my own little essential question uh, thingamajig in there. This is a great time to ask, has your ha lack of power ever been used against you? Uh, mm. Write a scenario where your character's motivation is complicated by their superpower. So that whole conversation that we were having during the student practice that Lillian like so wisely set up, this is a great time to think about how to, what is a scenario that organically would happen because of the burden of that superpower. Another great example of this is Into the Spider-Verse where yeah. like Miles, like throughout the whole time period, he keeps turning invisible because he can't control it until like the very end. <laughs> uh, and then option three, sorry, my foot itched. 
Uh, <laughs> option three, which is write a paragraph illustrating how your character reacts when confronted with their weakness. So yeah. <laughs> again, getting back to those essential questions, getting back to those like ideas of what does that burden look like? And is that burden part of how the character reacts when confronted with their weakness? Oh, I love all yeah. these because I know I'm glad you brought up uh, uh, into the uh, into the verse. What is it? Into the Spider Verse, yeah. Into the Spider Verse. Um, I, I love that movie. First of all, I love, I love, like, I loved all those kind of movies. But I was just like, oh, it's a kid animation. It's not going to be good, mind you. I have to take all my kids to all those movies. But I was just like, this isn't going to be good. And then when I watched it, I was like crying, <laughs> and, and it was such a great example of that age group of multiculturalism, of, uh, of, you know, of being Latino, being Afro-Latino, being, you know, all those things all wrapped up in this one character, but it, it really, specifically that burden of excelling, right? Of, of the burden of like, how do I, I love, the, I, there's so many levels to that. And it's a great example of like, how do we, you know, if you wanted to expand these exercises, these prompts is like, have, you know, have them watch a snippet of that, of that movie and then break it down. Of like what is the superhero yeah. superpower and then the burden of that superpower you know um break it down with the family dynamics the father the her his uncle's uh his dynamics with his uncle and his dynamics with his father you know all these things are like the perfect examples of the things that we're writing about i think yeah um, for sure yeah okay so should we uh ask some questions i think we have some time do yeah we? let's do i think we got some time i think we got like mm -hmm. somewhere north of 15 minutes i think yeah okay <laughs> so we got time we got some grit okay so oh okay how do you develop your characters so they are not cliches uh you you start this one off julia where how do you develop my characters how do i develop them so they're not, they're not cliches um okay not to get too woo woo off the rip, <laughs> uh, but I think that there's a word that's it, it's made up, but the word is called sonder, and it's about mm -hmm. and basically the word is made up to say that each person around you is living a life of tremendous detail and rich importance, as important and rich and deep as your own. And the reason I say that is because we often kind of come into it with a, or often we're couched to come into it with an understanding that like. This is a book that is for kids. Kids don't experience a depth of emotion that is as rich and powerful and important as our own. But if you're going to have, so it starts with an understanding of the respect for the interiority of your character. In order for them to have a superpower, they have to have a personhood. And so we start with the personhood and that book is ultimately going to give us the understanding of that superpower. So once you have all of those questions, it's impossible to see a cliche in the kit it's impossible to see only a cliche in a character who is slowly becoming a person to you mm. that's kind mm. of like my general opening understanding oh i love that i feel like also like sometimes that you the the beginning drafts of anything that you write you might just start off with the cliches and but as you grow as you uh, as you start to interview your characters as you start to really understand them that those cliches kind of start melting away because then you dig deeper it's always this idea of like you you could you could always dig deeper into understanding your characters um so that superficial cliche-ness all right that might be this the beginning structure but that will slowly uh pull away because then you're just like oh no this is too familiar let's let's go further into like why the why as to like what is it that they're in fear of what is it that they're embarrassed with you know all these things that will kind of like let you know that your character is well-rounded, you know, and not just like a superficial kind of one dimensional. Um, For sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay, another question. Oh no. Uh oh, <laughs> what superpowers would you pick for yourself? And how could it be a burden for you? Well, I'll tell you right now, <laughs> is that my superpower is writing, because that's what I said earlier. Um, and that's a burden because, you know, just ask my kids where am I, you know, am I, am I feeding them? No, I am writing a book. <laughs> and that is why it's a, uh, it could be a burden. If I prefer to live in a fantastical space, writing space instead of in the present and not to dig, you know, not, not to talk about di digging deeper 
I'll keep that to therapy. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, work. you know what I mean? Like, it's just this idea of like, I'd rather have control of this, of, of my writing world um, than whatever is happening out there. No doubt. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Mine is that I am perpetually split between a million different projects. And so I would like to be able to uh, clone and or multiply myself, which all, which at first it sounds like a great idea, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna like roll out a library next year of just like my own works and finally all of this work will be out of my head. But the thing is that I know me well enough that I know that clone me is also going to be like, but I'm the real Julian. <laughs> the next one after that is also be like, I'm the real Julian. And then we just have an argument. <laughs> now that's all we have. We don't have any more powers anymore. It's just an argument. <laughs> <laughs> see the burden the burden is right there <laughs> I was like i have a strong sense of self and that is actually going to be precisely my problem <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> um, okay. do you mind if i like before we get to go to the next question do you mind if i just like tack on one last thing to our previous question about uh cliches i also find that it's helpful especially with protagonists to be like what five what like three to five characters from other books hmm. are this character's favorite cousins <laughs> oh that's a that's a good one yeah i feel like that like it offers you an opportunity to like just tap in with like what about these worlds did you love what gave you space to like really dream with this character and they in turn have an expanded interiority that's outside of just what you're able to conceptualize now you're in community so then I ask, then I, I have this question then is that when you're writing, are you reading um, within that genre, genre within that, you know, whatever that world is that you're writing, are you reading in that space as well while you're writing? A bit. I think that I often end up reading a lot of contemporary while I'm reading fantasy and vice versa. So that way that I'm not like accidentally stealing like, oh, that's a really cool little mechanic. It would be a shame if somebody <laughs> changed it. <laughs> um, but no, I think that I read a, I read a lot in that space because I'm just like, you know, the thing is that like 12 year olds are a very specific mode of how uh, they talk, how they process information, the things that they are like faced up with. And so the thing that is always easiest is to talk with other 12 year olds. But unfortunately, right. during many of the times that I'm writing, they are in school. Right. So I, I go for the next best thing. <laughs> yeah, I always believe that community is always a good cure for cliche. Yeah, it is true. It's like you're, you're, I've always said that your job is really to be an observer of like, of conversations being held, you know, around you or being in being as present as possible when you're in a space like you know we do school visits so it's kind of a, like i live for those school visits because then oh, i'm like absolutely. oh i'm talking to young people and what are you into like what is you know what are people saying and what are the interactions like, like you know it's a dance and you want to be able to to kind of write it and so i really do, i do and i do read a lot like i read humorous books because this because barely floating is 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 funny or fun you know more funnier than most of my other books and so i was really like how do i write middle grade humor and and it came easy <laughs> but i wanted to write you know i wanted to read more in that world in that space <laughs> no is doubt there, is there any other questions that we have up oh okay no oh, yeah see humor uh, where do I get my great sense of humor? Honestly, Pilar is so much funnier than I am. Uh, I think that it, it started with an <laughs> understanding of that, for sure, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that, it, again, it's just an understand. Like, once you have an understanding of who this character is, you have an understanding of, like, what is fun, of, like, what would be funny or absurd to them because you have an understanding of their norm. And that's really all that, like, comedy is. <laughs> So I think that it was, a, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of just remembering kind of like what I was like at that uh, same age and generally always having like a pithy response that I just, I didn't say it, but I thought it real loud. And Pilar says it and thinks it real quiet. So that makes us siblings <laughs> in that way. <laughs> Do you feel like, um, I didn't realize when I was writing the book, I didn't real, I didn't know if it was like, I knew it was funny or I was trying to be funny, but I didn't know it was funny until I read it. And then people were laughing and I was like, okay, good. Because I was really nervous that it wasn't going to hit in any way. 
I was also worried about that, definitely and for sure, <laughs> uh, because there's there there is truly no silence like the silence of a middle grade cafeteria. It really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like it's just like, ooh, if that if it didn't hit, it didn't hit. Like, don't 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 say the joke again. They heard you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the the most critical uh, audience members is a group of uh, twelve year olds for sure. <laughs> you know, and that's how you like you know like you know you know you popping, <laughs> or you know you are not, <laughs> and that kind of that kind of honesty. It, it, it brings out the best in your humor, I'll tell you what. Oh, man. Okay, so I think we have one more question about writer's block. We're almost wrapping it up. It's very exciting. Um, how do you get over writer's block? Uh, okay, so I'll answer that. Um, first, I don't, I, the word writer's block feels like it's always feels so heavy to me. So I usually try not to think about, you know, whatever, whatever is, stopping me from proceeding as a block in a sense. I just think that it's just questions that I have to ask my characters even more. Like it really goes back to like, oh, who's this character again? I, maybe I forgot what, maybe she's, she's in, maybe I'm in the journey. I'm in, I'm writing about the journey. I'm in that aspect of the journey where she is as lost and I feel as lost <laughs> in mm. that writing that part, you know? And so then I just have to be reminded of like that character and what her desires are and what's her fears. And I have to go back to, to that, to those questions I was asking in the beginning. It's usually that those to me is when I'm, I'm pausing in my writing. It's um, and not in a sense writer's block to me. It's more like I, I need to ask my characters more questions. What do you think? Mm. I am generally inclined to agree. Like my thing that I always say, especially to like my my students, my young people around me, is just I don't believe in writer's block, but I do believe in depletion, right? Oh. I do believe in like a general understanding that like, hey, like maybe I've been too long surrounded only by my characters. Surround like this is what what gets back to our conversation about like reading outside of yourself, right? And like pulling those things in and finding ways that I can be in conversation with this world and with this book and with these characters that does not actually require me to be producing all the time because I I am a person. I have a mm -hmm. finite amount of energy and ability. And so I take a lot of walks. I make a lot of playlists. Like right now I have a folder <laughs> of just playlists for like, even like little side characters. Like they have like mm. little five, like song, <laughs> five to 10 song playlists as opposed to like 10 to 15 song playlists of like main cast. But it's a way that I think about like, what does it sound like inside? What does it sound like inside their head? What does it sound like in this world? And I can do that very passively. And it's a way that I replenish the part of me that first wanted to pick up a pen, first wanted to like type some stuff out on a keyboard mm. is that like I hear other people doing their work is what I mean when I say community is always a cure for cliche is I hear other people doing their work. I'm like, oh, I want to play too. <laughs> like, what if it was like this? <laughs> and then I, I'm back in that, I'm back in that kid mode, right? I'm back mm. in that open creative field space. But if I am only thinking about myself as like, you are an automaton who puts words on a page. If you are not in this chair, <laughs> you are failing. <laughs> Oh that my God, is yeah. where things that that's where like uh the Daniel Jose says like forgiveness, right? It's like if you mm -hmm. if you're somebody who writes every day, fantastic. But also the absence of writing on that particular day is maybe just the absence of routine. It's not the absence of ability. Mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, I love that. And it's such a good reminder. Um okay, I think we have one more question that's uh from a sixth grader. Hey, my people. <laughs> also, dope name. I Amazing know. Name. <laughs> I love this. Okay, how do you come up with the names of your characters? Um, this is before I abandon Facebook, and I think we should all abandon every social media platform, but that's just a, a side note, is that um, I used to look through my Facebook friends and see, oh, what's a name that sounds good or interesting? And then I'll, I'll also just look up you know, definitions of names and see what, which one really kind of makes sense for the project I'm working on. What, uh, how do you do your, your names? Okay. So I am big on symbolism. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I have have a lot of fun with that. So some of them are uh, names of people in my own work. Uh, Most recently, I think actually all of the boys on the basketball team are named after kids who asked me to name a character after them. (laughs) Uh, They're all in the same school, but you know what? I respect unions, even small ones. So first of all, that uh, Pilar would have been my name if I had been born my mother's daughter. Um, So that would have absolute. So that one was a factor in it. Any aunt figure that you ever see in my work is named after a woman author who I really admire. Mm. And uh, I think all of the uh, mask presenting characters in this new one that I'm like just starting out on, all of their last names are like various athletes who I've admired across the course of time. So this will be like, it'll be like little things like that, that I'm just like, oh, I also am a huge fan of naming things after historical figures that I wish that I'd known about when I was a kid. Mm, I love that. Uh, little I love, tidbit. I love, yeah. Yeah, I love an Easter egg. That's the word. That yeah. I, <laughs> I, you know, I've named characters out of, um, you know, friends, but I would forget. And so then when my friend read the book, it, oh, hey, is this is this supposed to be me? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> like, Word. Yes. Good catch. <laughs> I totally like I was like, oh, I don't remember. But they're like, hey, is this this is me? I was like, yeah. Oh, sh- yes. <laughs> yes <laughs> this it is, is you. It is, it is in fact you. <laughs> Well, this was wonderful. I think um, we're, that's it for all the questions. Um, All right, I'm just gonna say thank you for (laughs) attending our panels about superhero. I hope we were able to like get some, you know, get some really good writer's prompt that uh, some people can use in their classrooms. I love this kind of topic. Um, And uh, thank you for attending the Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival. Um, Gracias por estar con nosotros. um, And yes, Latinx Kid Lit Book Festival, it's a a mouthful. But um, I really hope we were able to get something out there, out of of this for everyone. (laughs) And thank you so much, everyone. Um, Thanks for coming, y'all. Have a good one. I'm just gonna go like this.